Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, first of all, I'd like to give a welcome to uh, the other departments that are here and uh, also to our distant, uh, our off-site uh, uh, colleagues. So in keeping with our theme of kind of the know your environment uh, theme, um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Eagle. Uh, as you all know, uh, he's president and CEO of Alberta Health Services. Uh, he's also a professor at the University of Alberta and uh, also at the University of Calgary and an adjunct uh, faculty member uh, at the University of Victoria. Um, he kind of needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, he uh, is, uh, has a long and uh, distinguished career in health uh, administration, uh, including um, uh, formerly Executive Vice President uh, and the uh, Chief Clinical Officer in Alberta Health Services, uh, as well as uh, with the Calgary Health Region and Foothills and uh, previously uh, Head of Anesthesia. Uh, he's also uh, brings experience from being on a number of healthcare uh, related boards, uh, including the Health Quality Council of Alberta and the Canadian Institute of Health Information. So Dr. Eagle, welcome to the department's uh, uh, Grand Rounds and thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. We look forward to your presentation. Thanks. Well, thank you for the invite to be here today. I hope the volume is sufficient and not too loud so people in the back row can hear and people in the front row are not overwhelmed by the noise, so you can sleep if you wish. Um, it's uh, great to be here. Uh, I, I do a lot of these sessions where I talk to uh, various groups about what's going on in Alberta Health Services from a fairly broad perspective. So there'll be things that I don't spend a lot of time talking about here, but there's a lot of opportunity to ask questions. And the questions I can answer, I will. The questions I can't answer because I just don't have enough information in front of me, we will answer as well. We'll give them back to the Department of Medicine so that they can be put on the website or, you know, just kind of so that you can see what, uh, so you get a full answer to what, what's going on. Um, I know that you had Fred Horn here a few weeks ago and uh, uh, I read some of the things that Fred had said and I, I, I'm not going to talk about health policy here. Uh, this is going to be very, very pragmatic and it's, it's very much, you know, what is going on in Alberta Health Services today, right now and what, what's actually you know, ahead of us over the next few months. Uh, as you know, uh, we have a new board chair, Stephen Lockwood, and uh, uh, Steve is a guy who's worked in the, uh, he's a lawyer, but he's worked in the uh, uh, energy and um, uh, actually trucking businesses in Alberta, and he's the president of one of Alberta's uh, uh, largest publicly traded company, which is not one that you probably know of, but it's Mullen Group, and they, they have about 13 or 15 subsidiary companies, so they're a very large company in Alberta. He brings a very strong private sector uh, background to uh, Alberta Health Services and, and concerned about a couple of things. One is uh, the ability of people to be able to make decisions in a rapid way and the other is for what do we know about the performance of this organization and what do we need to change in order to have better performance. So a very performance oriented uh, view of the world. Uh, I have an agenda. I'm not necessarily going to stick to this agenda. We're going to have a bit of a more general discussion. So I think I'll talk for about 20 to 25 minutes and then we'll turn it over to questions. And uh, as I said, the questions can cover the whole gamut of healthcare. Don't feel restricted to you know, what's in front of you in this talk today. Um, you know, healthcare by its nature is a very noisy environment. You've got tons of things going on. This is kind of a, a partial list of things that were on my list in the last week. Uh, it may not be much in terms of the noise that created across the uh, health system, but we had an accreditation done about two weeks ago, and the accreditation was actually, you know, fairly positive for an organization of this size. The accreditor, the chief accreditor, said that they'd seen, you know, marked improvement in the way Alberta Health Services is working, and uh, actually a remarkable improvement. So we have accreditation. We started this public inquiry process. There's never been a public inquiry into healthcare before in Alberta. And whether you, uh, you know, believe that the uh, uh, queue jumping or uh, expedited access issue is a significant concern or not, it's certainly going to absorb a lot of attention of the uh, healthcare leadership in Alberta from not only the uh, Alberta Health Services but also from other you know, groups across the province. Uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, something unprecedented and, uh, you know, as you know, it's hard to keep healthcare out of the media. 
you know, during that period of the public inquiry, we certainly will be in the media, and a lot of it will not be very positive, I think. Even good news is hard to get into the papers these days, and good news usually gets warped some way into being bad news, so not expecting a lot of positive things coming in the healthcare system then. We've had uh, you know, some ministerial directives given to us. We had one on food services. We've also had one that's related to three things, occupancy, uh, average length, uh, alternate level of care patients, and also uh, uh, how do we discharge patients from hospital. I'll talk a little bit about those ministerial directives later. We've had a number of uh, HQCA reviews. We have one coming out on anatomic pathology, which will, I think will be coming out on uh, uh, sometime next week that relates to anatomic pathology issues at the uh, Calgary Lab Services in uh, Calgary, but also at the Royal Alex Hospital in Edmonton. So there is some local issue in that. We have a Health Quality Council review that looks at satisfaction that's coming out in the next few months. That's done periodically. That'll create some attention. We have a Health Quality Council review that was done on primary care networks. I'm not sure the release date of that, net, of that report, but it will be done in the next few months. So we have a lot of things coming at us in terms of reviews. We have a very, very transparent system of performance reporting. We have about 60 indicators. It comes out once a quarter. And the indicators were chosen on things that were challenges for the health system, including things like emergency department weights and so on. So those performance reports, when they come out, don't necessarily look particularly good for Alberta Health Services. They don't talk about what our post-myocardial survival rate is. They don't talk about how well we do on stroke. They talk about the areas that aren't well. So we're looking at changing those performance reports so they become a little more balanced become a little more of a balanced scorecard. So we're not looking at everything that's bad in the health system every quarter because it just creates too much opportunity for the naysayers about our system to give an unbalanced view. House is in session. So we have lots of issues coming to us from question period. We have public accounts, which is a MLA-led committee that looks at how the healthcare system is spending its money. So that's, you know, that created a fair bit of interest in primary care networks and things like waste management. A lot of concerns around primary care in Alberta, and I think the minister talked about this. You know, what are family care centers? What do they mean? What are the, how have they been described? How do you get to be a family care center? None of that has been released at this point in time, and the primary care networks are a significant concern for Albertans as well. They're a thing that seemed to be quite successful, and yet at the same time, the, the ambiguity about where primary care networks finish up in this time where there is significant concern and distress because of not having an AMA agreement uh, is creating a fair bit of concern. Today, as usual, there's an article in both the Calgary Herald and the Edmonton Journal about expenses. Expenses are not the biggest thing in the healthcare system, believe it or not, uh, but they do occupy an enormous amount of uh, media attention. We have still a five-year health action plan that was signed off when Minister Zwistewski was the Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, we have a five-year funding agreement and we're entering the last two years of that five-year funding agreement where the funding increase into health care will be 4.5 percent. Now that sounds like a pretty big number compared to anywhere else in the country, but that is the lowest year-over-year -year increase in funding that's happened in Alberta for health care since 1995. So it's a very substantial change for this health system. We've got lots of stuff going on in uh, strategic clinical networks. Uh, we have a lot going on in negotiations. The AMA and the minister are exchanging positions at this point in time and uh, not sure where that will land. Uh, but we also have UNA negotiations that will start. The UNA contract ends in March 31st of next year. So we have a lot of negotiation issues as well. So this all adds up to health being constantly a source of uh, uh, irritation for the media, speculation, very politically active, and a lot of concern around the health agenda. If you read only what you look at in the newspapers around the health file, you'd think the health system was on the edge of disaster every day of the week. And what I see is something that's very different, but something that where we also, despite being not what's in the newspaper, we need to change. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about three factors that are kind of working together here. One is the budget, this 4.5%. What will that force us to do? A little bit about decision-making in AHS. And, uh, uh, you know, we've come from a very centralized organization to one that's increasingly becoming decentralized, and that's necessary to improve the rate at which we make decisions. 
And finally, a little bit about where healthcare needs to go. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Institute of Medicine report that was released in draft form in September and where we align with that and where we don't. We have some significant opportunities to make Alberta Health Services actually become a leading health delivery organization, not only in the country but internationally, if we do it right, I think. So the new board chair, what does he bring? So he brings a few fundamental principles. One is very much wants to continue the evolution that started in the late 2010 when I became CEO, we created zones and the zones became our operating units. The zones are, are still clunky in terms of being operating units. They're still too far from the front lines. So we're going to look at having a lot more local decision making over the next while because the time of flight of decisions is really important. We have frontline managers who are waiting for the answers to questions that they had. They've been waiting for 18 months to get a reply. If you haven't had a reply in 18 months, you ain't going to get a reply. That, that process has been lost. We have to make decision making a whole lot better. We also need some competition in this healthcare system. And the competition isn't about dollars necessarily. It's about performance measures. So we're looking at how do we have competition between hospitals on length of stay, on safety, on health place work and safety, all of those types of things so that people can find where the best practices are and actually use them across the system. In the past, we've had a lot of people telling us what we cannot, cannot do, can and cannot do on operation, operating decisions. So our board chair is very much taking the view that we have to be able to act and move. So brief history, most of you have lived through this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but pre-2008, we had 12 separate health entities, nine regions, three boards, uh, very siloed, um, lack of provincial coordination, 2008. Uh, I'm not sure what the trigger for it was, but AHS was created and consolidated into a single health region and there were some advantages to that. There was a, the immediate saving about um, 650 million dollars per year in decreasing duplication of finance systems, HR systems, you, know, you name it. There was a, a significant savings. We started to break down some of the silos before, between the previous regions and sort of commenced a, a period of uh, provincial coordination and leading forward really to the creation of things like the strategic clinical networks. Uh, in 2011 we had a lot of change, created the zones, started working on this five-year health action plan with the government and we had the funding that kicked in. Uh, in 2012 uh, I think there's a sense that there's a whole lot less noise in the uh, system, patient satisfaction is improving, uh, our Staff engagement surveys, although they're not great, they show improvement and substantial improvement. They just have a long way to go. And our operational uh, performance is improving. But as I mentioned, 2013 and 14 are going to be significant problems for us. If you look at where we're spending money, 70% of it goes to salaries. Uh, and the salary inflation is 3%. So we've chewed up a lot of that 4.5% just by standing still. We've made commitments particularly to long-term care and seniors care of another 1%. So we're close to the 4.1% with just standing still. So if we want to do new things, if we want to reshape this healthcare system, we have to look for internal savings. So people have heard a lot about us, you know, looking for savings within the organization. It is the only way we can reshape how we spend money. It's the only way we can create the, the room that we need to be able to afford things like a patient care information system in Edmonton. You know, we have to reshape the way we spend money. And that, uh, you know, in a system that's grown uh, easily, kind of like a snowball going downhill. There's been a lot of focus on what new things are going into the system, but not a lot of focus on what needs to be done to be efficient in the system. And we can all identify areas of waste. So we're going to have to go back into the system and look at where we can use frontline knowledge to actually look at making savings. So uh, our board chair has also uh, taken the view that we can be a best-in-class health organization and, our, uh, and we can also look at external benchmark organizations and there are a few that come to mind in North America. One is Geisinger which is a, a HMO type organization in central Pennsylvania. Uh, Geisinger has a wall-to-wall -wall electronic health system. It's got integration of primary care with acute care systems. It's got physicians who are uh, working towards performance goals that are related to patients. This is the benchmark organization. We've looked at them. 
Intermountain Health is an organization we've looked at for a long time. Uh, and also uh, Kaiser Permanente. So we're looking around at how we can learn from the best. We also have to ensure that, uh, that we are sustainable and we have to build back some pride into the system. So not only for AHS, but for individual hospitals like the University Hospital. You know, we've lost, by becoming homogenous across the province, we've lost a lot of that brand recognition that people need. Our foundations want us to have that. The public identifies with local facilities. We have to build back in that local pride into this health system. Um, our board chair has also uh, looked uh, across other industries. And there, there's a, a quote from Jack Welsh, which I think we need to pay attention to, is when changes on the outside of the organization is greater than the inside, the end is near. And if you think of a few examples, you can go from General Motors to Greece and realize that if you don't keep up with the rapidly changing environment, you're going to be in problems. And if you look at what we're not spending a lot of time on, we're not spending enough time on using analytics in the system with the data that we have. Uh, we're not spending enough on operations management. And we're not spending enough on particularly clinical IT. You know, we have to have an electronic system that covers the, all of the facilities that we have, but also into the primary care world. And we have to figure out how to do that starting in a 4.5% budget year. So this is not simple, uh, but if you take your eyes off of the long-term goal and start doing, you know, there will be no travel, there will be no education, there will be no pencils, and there will be no coffee, you know, as your way of saving money, you basically lose track of the important things you need to do. And the, there is a burning platform here. This is kind of the slide that Stephen Duckett might present if he were here. It says that uh, you know, Canada is not doing particularly well in performance. In this list, it's uh, number six out of seven. Uh, but it is quite expensive. And Alberta is very expensive. We're the most expensive province uh, for health care per capita in the country, with the exception of Newfoundland. Uh, and that trend uh, has spent slightly recently. but. There's a lot of questioning from our po politicians about why this is so expensive. <coughs> the other thing that's forcing this is Alberta's revenue uh, expectations going forward. You've heard, you know, the, the story on this. I mean, you know, the projections on oil revenue, bitumen level, and natural gas revenue are much off of what they need to be. And uh, we are, AHS is, about 23% of the provincial budget. So if you know the provincial budget is having problems, we are going to have problems. We are going to be asked to be more efficient. And we're not being asked to be more efficient. We're actually involved in a government process to be more efficient. Uh, in April of this year, the government passed an act, which is called the Results-Based Budgeting Act. Basically, through that act, they go through every uh, government department agency. And we're certainly one of the biggest agencies that they have trying to identify what the value for money invested is. So the first year of this is this year. Next year, uh, the government face, places more emphasis on health, and they'll be looking at what the value achieved from investment in acute care is. This is a huge piece of work. It's going to be very challenging, and it's the first time they've done this. So we're not exactly sure whether this is going to land for us, but it's going to be a significant uh, uh, pressure to make sure that we can demonstrate positive outcomes for every dollar that we invest. This is going to be a significant uh, pressure for us, and we don't actually know the pathway here, but it reinforces that need for efficiency and for uh, you know, looking at how we spend health dollars. Uh, the system fundamentals are pretty straightforward. We've got 3.7 million patients. We have some variability in the facilities that we have. We have some pretty good facilities, though. We have some excellent programs. Uh, we struggle on the equipment piece. You know, we use a lot of support from foundations to bring in, you know, equipment earlier and faster. Uh, particularly replacement of equipment is a problem. But our major asset is our workforce. And we have roughly 100,000 people, if you look at physicians, clinical staff, and so on. And that's really where we need to spend a lot of attention. Because we can't make the changes that we need in this organization without having a very, very strong uh, and uh, engaged workforce. And we're starting from a position where we do not have an engaged workforce. So eventually what this means is we have to go from a situation that's basically a very hierarchical, pyramidal kind of organizational model that uh, has a CEO at the top and everybody waiting for commands to come from the top to a more flat organizational model. Um, sorry. Um, the, when I took over from Stephen Duckett, every person who was hired in AHS had to be approved by me. Now you can imagine what that was like. I inherited a pile of 
uh, recruitment request was about this high. How could I possibly know whether another physiotherapist was required in Fort McMurray or not? You know, so that, that was the level of concentration that we had of decision making in AHS at the end of 2010. You know, we have to devolve that. We can't possibly make decisions fast enough if everything has to go through the CEO office or even the zone lead office. We have to get this down to local facilities. So these, these are things that the board chair has said, we're going to drive down decision making. We're going to have to make this system a little simpler and we need this healthy competitive environment based on metrics, based on performance comparison so we can actually look at how different places are functioning and how we can learn from the people who are doing really well. Um, so Steve has come to a model he calls a self-managed operating unit, which is basically, you know, if you run a hospital like this, you should control every service in it, not, you know, some are reporting to Edmonton, some are reporting to Calgary, but people in the hospital aren't accountable for what they, they, they do. So in, in our decision-making silos, we have something that I call the inverted U, sort of the horseshoe upside down there. And the problem with that is that you start in the bottom left-hand corner of the horseshoe with a person wanting to make a decision about parking. We had a great little example in Medicine Hat. Uh, a, a person there wanted to get uh, parking paid for for seniors who were in hospital, not because they wanted to be, but because they had to be. And their families were coming several times a week to see them. They had to pay for parking every visit. So it seemed like a simple thing. You know, we'll send off this request. We'll get parking for those people paid for. It couldn't be done locally. Had to come to an office in Edmonton to get approved. Uh, 18 months after that initial request, I went back to Medicine Hat and said, oh, did you get that fixed? Is that all good? No, we haven't heard a thing. You know, we have not heard a thing. So you know, if you look at the challenge we have in trying to make rapid decisions to meet those 4.5% years, and it takes 18 months to get a decision about a parking pass, you know, that does not work. You know, so we have to change the way we do this. So our large hospitals have to be much more able to make decisions about their local environments. And if you talk to people from our rural areas, uh, you go to uh, a you know, hospital in, in uh, say, Camrose, it's likely you'll walk in the door and if you ask who's in charge of that facility, no one will be able to tell you. You know, there's no site leadership. There's a lead for surgery, there's a lead for medicine, they're all across the zone, but there's no one in charge of that facility. We have to be much more clear about who's in charge of what. And that those, that, you know, this is an evolution from everything going through the CEO office, but it's not really correct, and it's, you can't really make decisions that way. So self-managed operating unit, what does it mean? It means that people are held accountable for their performance and they're uh, accountable for what happens at that site. I mean, it's just kind of, in a way, back to the future. I mean, hospitals were like that in 1991 when I sort of became the department head of anesthesia in Calgary. But the big difference is there will be provincial standards, provincial metrics, and provincial support systems like finance, IT, and so on. We also expect that these hospitals will not only look internally to look at their efficiencies, but they must look externally. They must look at how they relate to local primary care networks, senior centers, and so on. It's not good for a hospital just to look at what comes through its doors and what leaves. The things that come through the door of a hospital have to be looked at in a community setting. If they're not looked at in a community setting, then you're, we can never keep up in terms of building the amount of acute care that we need. So although we're going to this self-managed operating unit system, we are certainly not building a, a system of individual icebergs. We don't want to increase the number of silos in this organization. There are a number of potential advantages if we do this right, and these advantages are also all risks. If we don't do it right, things won't get better. Things from patient satisfaction, uh, rapid response, lower costs, all of those things can happen if we do this right. If we don't do it right, the reverse will happen. So it's a real issue in terms of being effective in how we manage this incremental change. So we started thinking about how to do this, and uh, uh, we're going to try a demonstration project at the Rocky View, and I'm actually uh, going to the Rocky View on Monday night to talk to the staff there to get this project started. Uh, we're gonna, we have lots of groups that are interested in developing this model. A lot of the rural facilities want to have much more control of how their local facilities work. Um, there's a lot of interest in uh, places that are new, like the South Health Campus in Calgary is basically a self-managed unit already, so there's very little change there. So when this has been talked about with our senior leaders, you know, they, there's a lot of uptake in this. They see that, you know, we really do have to change. And there's been a lot of 
um, interest in Alberta in having stability in the system. And you've got to be careful how much change you introduce. So the Health Quality Council report that came out last year talked about not doing any major changes. So this, this is not really a structural change. You won't see too much in the sense of having different organizational models or boxes or the org diagrams going through enormous change. It's more of a physiologic or functional one, you know, where it's much clearer to people in those boxes what decisions they can make. Uh, so we're not trying to blow up the world here, but we are trying to get into an environment where we can move more quickly. So these are some of the things that we've looked at we think should be site responsibilities. Employee safety, food services, you can read the list. On the medical side, we're going to go much slower. Uh, but there are obvious disconnects between what is provincial and what is local for areas like diagnostic imaging. Diagnostic imaging has done a great job as a provincial unit. It's come standardization in terms of, you know, where we put the next MRI. We have plans for all of that. We have, you know, good contracts in terms of getting excellent value for money with uh, purchasing of uh, expensive radiology equipment. Uh, but if you talk to people in a hospital and sort of say, you know, you're doing patient flow stuff, you know, how are the uh, diagnostic imaging department involved in that? What you often hear is, well, they're there if it suits them, and they're not if it doesn't, because they were responsible to a provincial unit. So we have to make much more responsible uh, decision making for the local uh, area in some of these medical areas as well. It, this changes what the zones are currently doing too. So that right now the zone leads like Mike Conroy and, uh, and uh, people like that are very much involved in day to day decisions in hospitals. This changes them to looking at how patients flow across a, a zone. Uh, looking at mentoring the local teams and looking at the performance measures for each of the local hospitals. So this changes what they do fairly dramatically. Still means they're there and they still have the same accountability, but they've got to do a whole lot more in terms of bringing on people and looking at the performance of the system. Uh, it also changes what we do at the corporate level. We become much more the shared service organization, the, the one that provides all those backbone systems and overall strategy rather than having a CEO who is involved in the micromanagement of every facility across Alberta, which is a, a futile task when you know you have over 100 hospitals in a province. You, you just can't do that. So we'll become much more monitoring performance and much more looking at strategy. And uh, if you think about it, that makes perfect sense. There was a Canadian who was a business consultant who uh, uh, lived in the 50s and 60s, most productive in the 50s and 60s, named Elliot Jacks. And he wrote a book that was called Requisite Organization. And the, the, or, the model of the, in that book is that leaders have to have a span of control that looks into time. So that a CEO should be looking at things that are, you know, 10 to 20 years in the future. Uh, an, an upper management person should be looking at five. A frontline manager, maybe six months. But what we've done in our organization is mix all of that. So that we have, you know, you know CEOs who are looking at things that have a time span of three months and not enough span on looking at what we really need to do in the system to create the best in class. You know, it's if we were going to look like Geisinger Health, you know, not enough time is being spent on that. So it changes what the leadership of the organization does. And these are the things that will likely remain very much centralized. You know, we've got a very good provincial finance system developing. We've got some very good payroll, insurance, you know, all of the internal audit stuff that we do. All of that should stay central. So, so there are things that are going to become local, some things that will remain in the zones, and some that will become very much, you know, the stay in the role of the provincial organization. So as I mentioned, the, the next steps are basically to get this Rocky View demonstration project up and running, and then we'll see where we go after that. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the rate limiting step on this is not people's interest but the ability of our financial systems to keep up with this degree of change. Every time that you change where a unit reports, you know, you have a significant amount of uh, stuff to do in making sure the budget flow follows that uh, change. So that will be the right limiting step. Um, these are the guiding principles that our, our chair has talked about. Uh, a very strong concentration on excellence, um, particularly safety, operations management, financial performance. Uh, very strong emphasis on leadership. Make sure that the leaders in this organization have a clear path of where we're going. Uh, make sure that we spend a lot of time looking at this through the patient's eyes in terms of safety, quality, satisfaction. You know, it's, the, this system is there for a purpose. It's not there for administrators. It's not there for buildings. It's about you know, how do we treat the needs of Albertans, the citizens who need this healthcare system. So that becomes a very significant guiding principle. 
I'm looking at new opportunities. You know, how, what, how, what can we learn from the best in class in integrated healthcare systems? What can we bring into this province? What can, we, what can we take out of this province? I mean, some of the things that have been done with uh, surgical care for uh, arthroplasty in this province have been national uh, in terms of their impact. And fifth, get rid of some of this bureaucracy. Uh, everything in this organization must have a useful purpose. Um, so the part of the key to success is what I talked about, that requisite organization where you have each level of the organization looking at the decisions it needs to make in its time span and looking at making sure that the workforce is heavily engaged in this process. There are significant risks in any change. Uh, our people risk is the biggest. You know, are we attracting, retaining, and training the people that we need for the roles that we have? Can we learn and adapt quickly enough? Can we deal with the spiraling cost problem? And can we get the decisions made? I'm going to close to the, the, the finish here, but I just wanted to talk about the impact of the three ministerial directives that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, so in, I think it was late February actually, we got uh, a formal directive from the minister, and that's about as uh, binding as you could possibly have in a public organization, to draw up occupancy to 95%, ALCs by 50%, and have this coordinated discharge approach. Now, some of the hospitals, and it was the top seven hospitals across the province, hadn't seen an occupancy rate of 95% since probably the 1980s. So this was a very, very significant change. And so we've done a number of things. We'll be reporting next week publicly of how we've done and what we've done to achieve these targets. Uh, but we spent a lot of time thinking about that the numbers are one thing, right? I mean, you can achieve numbers on any day of the week, but you know, can you achieve them the next day? How do you make this part of the system? Well, the only way we can really make this sustainable uh, is if we look at it from the patient perspective and look at what's coming into our facilities and leaving. You know, what do we have in terms of integrating our hospitals with the primary care system? Not much, not enough. What do we do in terms of integrated discharge planning into the community? What do we do in terms of bringing our home care and uh, community long-term care centers into our planning for discharge? We don't do enough. And we also don't spend a lot of time thinking about who our most frequent customers are. And this is where analytics come in a lot. But we don't even do simple things. Like we can identify right now the 5% of the population who are absorbing roughly 60% of the AHS, AHS healthcare costs. You know, but we don't identify them, we don't look at the needs that they have that we can address specifically for them. You know, we have to be much more selective in how we build programs. For example, there is a, a patient who uh, has been in and out of the Rocky View Hospital six times in the last year. Uh, four times those admissions resulted in the, her going to ICU. The reason that she was having that problem was that she required medication, roughly $30,000 worth of medication per year. When she was at home, she could not afford to buy that medication. She was not getting the medication. So there we have you know, six admissions, four ICU visits, and we could deal with that with a you know, $30,000 per year investment. Why are we not doing that? We have to be much more targeted in the way we're doing it. A little bit advanced home care, work with the pharmacist. You know, we can maintain people in communities. Why are we not doing that? And so that's my you know, pressure on the leaders of the organization to start looking at targeted populations and being much more effective in how we deal with them. Um, so I, I, you know, th this is an Institute of Medicine um, monograph. It, uh, I don't know if it's been formally released in its final view yet, but this is available on the Institute of Medicine webpage. Uh, it created a fair amount of stir when it came out in uh, late, late August or early uh, September because it showed there was an awful lot of waste in the U.S. healthcare system, and there is. And I'm not saying that we're any different. Uh, I just wanted to look at what are the key principles that they looked at in terms of you know, how healthcare systems needed to change and where we are. Uh, first recommendations, you've got to have data and you've got to have uh, information at your fingertips. So where are we at with the digital infrastructure? Well, I'd say that Alberta has spent an awful lot of money on uh, electronic health records and medical records of one kind or another, but we're really not where we need to be. Ten years ago, I was in Spain and looked at a system that had been developed in Andalusia. And basically, if you went into an emergency department in Andalusia, you had a client card. That client card was necessary for the physicians to be able to see who you were and what your history had been. What, what, were, you, what were your current problems? Without that card, unless it was an extreme emergency, your information was private. Having accessed that system, 
if you came with an orthopedic problem and the emergency doc wanted to refer you to an orthopedic surgeon, real time that appointment could be made. You could pull up a screen, it would have each orthopedic surgeon's office have their wait times, you see where the empty slots were, you see what day's done. If that patient needed a prescription, it was done in the emergency department. By the time the patient got to the pharmacy, that prescription had been processed. Same information system. That, that's what an integrated electronic health system should do. And it, I mean, it works in every other kind of industry, right? I mean, you know, why, why are we not doing this stuff in healthcare? And we've put a lot of money into it, but we do not have the digital infrastructure. Behind that digital infrastructure is you start to collect all kinds of information about how people flow through the healthcare system, what their needs are, and what services are being met and not being met. So you finish up having a data analytic model behind it. And we're ma actually making some projects, uh, pro uh, progress on that. Uh, we've been able to collect an, uh, into a single database enormous amount of information about uh, healthcare delivery in Alberta through a group called Dimer, which actually reports to Catherine Todd. Um, that group uh, has standardized data definitions, has aggregated data, has connections to the data that's available in, in uh, Alberta Health, so we can look at, you know, uh, the um, uh, depersonalized physician billing information so you can see how patients flow through the system. Uh, but we don't deal with that sort of information real time. We need to get there. So we've got a ways to go there. But we do have, the data utility is actually coming. Well, if you don't have an electronic system, you're not going to have very good clinical decision support. What you have are practice guidelines that sit on a shelf. So we're not good there. Patient-centered care, not particularly good there either. Uh, we have, you know, various ways of bringing patients into our system to give advice but we don't do it in a particularly advanced or sophisticated way. Five and six, we actually have some pretty good things going on. Our structure actually promotes the ability to have community links. If you look at the Obama accountable care implications, many hospitals in the United States are now reaching out to their community partners across organizational silos, across barriers, so they can look at the patient flow. Well, we actually have that system. We have a structure that supports that, but we have to use it better. So the community links and care continuity you know, we have in this system. Uh, op optimized operations. You know, if you look at the health system in Ontario, they have a lot of structural problems. Uh, but they have a lot of pe uh, people who have operations management experience in their hospital. So you have people who come out of the auto industry and know how to an handle, you know, complex industrial processes, looking at those types of processes in the hospital. And it's because of that concentration of the auto industry in Ontario. We don't have that. We do not have the same level of investment in uh, operations management and we need to get there and that kind of goes together with you know looking at patient flow looking at an, an electronic health record system you know you want to codify best practice and if you have operations management of that sophistication you can actually do that so again it's a skill that we need to build and look to the relationship with our universities to uh, uh, to help us build that kind of expertise um, this is a system that's basically financial incentive free you know we, we get paid more or less regardless of what we do. And it's a little more embarrassing if we don't do well, but the money continues to roll in. Um, so we won't have competition on finance in any easy way, but we will have a lot more competition on performance, transparency, right down to the hospital level. You know, from things like length of stay to patient safety to workplace safety, as I mentioned before. And we will try and broaden the leadership in this organization. So those 10 things that come from the Institute of Medicine report. We've got probably three or four where we're doing pretty well and have strong opportunity. Some that are, you know, correctable and some that are a major challenge. But it's interesting to see that the, you know, the first part of the talk actually did connect pretty well to this Institute of Medicine report. And those of you who remember the first Institute of Medicine report on patient safety will realize the impact that report had. And I think this one on waste will have a similar impact, not only on the U.S. healthcare system, but on ours. So uh, I said we'd kind of work our way through these three uh, interconnected gears, talked a little bit about the impact of budget, talked a little bit about what that means in terms of better decision making in this organization, and talked a little bit about where I think we need to go in terms of refining the goals of this organization and how we work together to improve the patient journey so that they can get from a long-term care center to a hospital, back to the community, and have appropriate care at each step along the way. So I said we'd have some time for questions, and I've talked a lot longer than I thought somehow, but uh, we're open to questions. And I've, I've taken a sort of a narrow segment here, and I don't know if we have 
Lauren Terrell in the audience and I said absolutely nothing about research. Apologies, Lauren, but <laughs> you know, you can only talk about what you could talk about. So anyway. So uh, open to you for questions. So thanks. Thanks for your attention. Coming up to Edmonton and uh, oh, I Edmonton. live in Edmonton. Oh, I miss I, the yeah. So that's, this is one of Excellent. the great myths. This health system is directed from Calgary. I've lived in Edmonton since uh, early 2009, and I run into people all the time. Say, "You going home for the weekend?" And I say, "I am home." You know? <laughs> that's wonderful. So it's, it's always been a little challenge to explain to people that I'm an Edmontonian. I feel like a Calgarian, but I'm actually an Edmontonian. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. That's <laughs> great. Um, I'm just going to ask a question about lab services. Yeah. Um, you addressed that bit in, in, in your discussion. And one of the things I have, um, especially moving from Ontario to here a few years ago, I was uh, impressed with the amount of privatized lab services in Alberta. Yeah. We know there's a lot of literature that shows um, that pri more privatized structures is more costly to the health system in different areas. I'm just wondering if AHS um, is uh, specifically looking at increasing the health region funded lab service provisions as opposed to distributing more of those services to privatized structures, i.e. DKML or we deal with privatized pulmonary function labs, um, access to sleep lab facilities from a respiratory perspective. That's uh, quite a significant issue. Yeah. Any comments? Um, so that's uh, you know, a complex, so the question is around the blend of public-private coverage of lab services in Alberta. And it's a, a complex issue because of the level of investment that's required for some of the, the labs in uh, Alberta. We, we have a, a contract with Dynalife that's coming to an end. There's a you know, 13, 15 year contract coming to an end in uh, two years. Um, you know, we're looking at how do we renew that contract. Uh, and uh, you know, we, in Alberta, we have kind of an interesting blend. The south half of the province, south part of the province, is covered largely by CLS, Calgary Lab Services, and uh, that was originally a public-private partnership, but was become a public only at this point in time. In Edmonton and North, there's a lot of uh, investment in DynaLife. Um, what really matters to me is that you can measure the performance of these labs. So, you know, when we've, we've actually used a comparator between. Uh, CLS and DynaLife to see where, where the best performance is and holding, you know, holding one to the other so there's a competitive environment. Um, there are parts of the lab system that are not part of uh, uh, um, AHS. I mean, there's obviously a fair bit of stuff done, you know, through fee-for-service mechanisms in the community. I think, you know, I'm not sure that we fund every sleep lab, for example. We don't have an organizational philosophy that says we're going to choose a public or a private model. Uh, but we're going to choose the ones that are most cost effective, but we've got to have you know, similar accountability for performance across whether we do it ourselves or we have you know, private organizations that do it. And getting transparency in those contracts so you can hold private providers accountable for performance is, is important. But uh, uh, we d have done some uh, fairly significant comparisons between CLS and DynaLife and uh, it seems to be a bit of a wash whether we do it ourselves or uh, through the uh, private sector. So you have obviously have a reaction to that. So I, I can you stand up again? Because it, it, it's, really, it's just hard to hear. Uh, I've noticed a difference in access mm -hmm. in terms of not, not just like, like biology or chemistry but more complex lab services and a sleep lab is a perfect uh, example or more complicated pulmonary physiology tests from a respiratory perspective. Yeah. So access indirectly can be potentially affected from the north. So itself. yeah, I obviously can't comment on the sleep, but we'll look into that and uh, thank you for the question and comments, important one. So we'll see if this non-working microphone will eventually come to life. Thank you for your presentation. I just based on infrastructure spending. Uh, uh, infrastructure spending, every time I turn around there's something else being demolished in this beautiful hospital next door and I just wonder why, like the emergency room for pediatrics was just the paint was barely dry and they come in and demolish it and rebuild it and I just wonder how we make these decisions, what's the rationale be behind destroying structures that are perfectly okay, like the medicine clinics that we had here were really good clinics and now they're being demolished and the pulmonary function lab on the second floor is also being removed and 
to me, it doesn't make sense from a financial point of view to, to take fully functioning structures and, and, I don't know, destroy them and rebuild them. Hmm. The, so this is about, you know, how do we decide, you know, what capital investments to make and what to renovate. Uh, an example was the Stollery uh, Emergency Department. Uh, what I had heard, you know, was that this was a project that started, you know, prior to 2008 in terms of, you know, its beginning. So I don't know much about the beginning of it, but uh, what I was hearing from the emergency physicians is the capacity there was completely inadequate for the patient volume. So most, most of the time, the, the, the general process of how capital gets dealt with is, is really complicated now. And uh, it's multi-government department, so it's not altogether to do with health. So, so what, what we do is ask each of the zones to sort of tell me, you know, what, what are your highest priorities? And for those highest priorities, they have to do something called a needs assessment, which is a formal process that we have to submit to the Department of Health to get their approval for these projects. So we start with, I, I don't know, we probably have you know, several hundred projects across the province. Uh, we're likely in any year to get maybe five funded. Um, so we take the needs assessment to health. Health looks at us that this is good, this is not good. Okay, if they want it, then they do a business case. They take their business case, they take it to infrastructure. Department of Infrastructure looks at it and says, this is something that we want to support. Then it goes to Treasury Board. Treasury Board is made up of MLAs and obviously very senior uh, cabinet uh, members as well. And cabinet makes a decision that is based not only on sort of what the health needs are, but what the needs are for highways, what the needs are for you know, all other kinds of capital infrastructure. And then through that process, eventually we'll get a trickle back that sort of says, yo, we support this project or we don't. And uh, you know, we're still dealing with uh, you know, projects that uh, we're, many were sort of talked about last week and we have announcements of you know, hospitals politically and then we're trying to figure out retrospectively you know, how do we make that hospital announcement work you know, and, uh, uh, and such a long gap between a political announcement of a project and, and when it comes on. So you know, if you look at um, an example of how long some of this planning takes, um, the, when they blew up the Calgary General Hospital in was that 1997 there was a commitment made to the then board chair of the Calgary Health Region that that facility would be rebuilt well what is it now 2012 13 so you're looking at a facility rebuild basically from you know the commitment to the opening of being 16 years and I don't think that process is getting any faster and then we have all the problems of the provincial revenues you know that that, you know, they, right now they don't have any capital dollars. So, so the processes that you talk about are, you know, very problematic. Uh, but we have, um, you know, I think the, the processes are there to support a goal, which is patient care. And if we're not getting the things lined up right, then, you know, you know there needs to be, you know, processes that you, you know, like Mike Conroy should know that the process, that what you're hearing about in terms of the pro projects that are being done aren't meeting the needs that you see in this facility. So. Yeah. So, sorry for the you know, rather bureaucratic answer, but that's my world, so yeah. Go ahead. Thank you again for coming back. Let's come back to the research. And Ross and, and Lauren and I and lots of other people in this room uh, have a major commitment to uh, doing clinical research. Uh, and we think, at least I think, and I'm sure my colleagues agree with this, that we are contributing to the welfare of the uh, health system by providing world-class care for patients, giving them access to new treatments, uh, be being able to evaluate those treatments and to get them integrated into the healthcare system. Unfortunately, Alberta Health Services looks at this as some sort of luxury that uh, physicians are involved in and that, for instance, if we want to get some lab tests done or some imaging done uh, in support of our uh, clinical research, we are charged cost plus by Calgary Lab Services or DKML or, or uh, by uh, MIC for, for that. And uh, I, I, it's a long-winded in introduction to say what, what is Alberta Health Services' approach to the uh, support and facilitation of clinical research? Yeah. Uh, okay, good question and complicated answer. So, you know, we're, we're trying to build a better support for all types of research, probably not 
pillar one, two, but two and three, that, three and four definitely. So, uh, I, you know, we have now a uh, senior vice president for research, Catherine Todd, you know, and I think probably you should have her come and talk to the Department of Medicine sometime about, you know, what we're doing specifically. Um, what I'm trying to do is build much better relationships with both the uh, uh, universities, particularly the Faculty of Medicine in both in, uh, in Calgary and Edmonton, with uh, Alberta Innovates Health Solutions. I think a lot of the, the things that uh, we're doing through our clinical networks in terms of population health research and systems, health systems research, you know, that, there's a very strong linkage there. Uh, it was not, it's not my intention to use research as a profit center. So if we're, you know, if you're being charged an additional margin, we'll look into that. You know, it's not, that's not reasonable. Well, they, uh, they are trying yeah, to yeah. The, the, um, you know, I, I kind of go back a long way, but uh, in, in sort of the early days of my career, I looked at the relationship that we had between the uh, university, their, the recruitment that we shared between the health system and the university, and the ability to link philanthropic support into that as being one of the key levers that we had in Alberta, supported by Al Alberta Heritage, right? And each piece of that uh, system has taken a pretty severe hit over the last, you know, five years. So what I would like to do is to try and rebuild that because, you know, we, we have to build, I think we can be very, very competitive in terms of recruitment of clinician scientists here, but we've got to be smart about what we're doing. And I think it's one of the assets collectively, not just in the health system, that we've let atrophy. And it's, you know, we've lo we're losing and have lost a significant competitive advantage that took decades to build. And, uh, you know, you, you look at how do you attract the next generation of, you know, health leaders aren't just bureaucrats. Health leaders are people who are clinician scientists, who are, you know, uh, people who bring new skills or, you know, bring new teams to Alberta. And, you know, working with the, you know, faculty of medicine in both provinces, and we have Dean Miller here today sitting behind you, you know, we're looking to how we actually start to, to do that more and more. And uh, uh, we have to go back to the knowledge generation capacity that's in Alberta and support it actively. So a kind of very nonspecific, but kind of impassioned kind of response, I guess. So thanks for the question. Though. And I th really do think it would be good to have Catherine Dodd come to one of your rounds to talk about you know, how AHS is refiguring itself in the research domain, because we've done a lot over the last year. Yeah. Can I just add to that that uh, I think what you're expressing is that uh, we get the message from from uh, middle management mm. that um, yeah. we don't support research. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm not arguing with you. Yeah. I'm just saying yeah. this is the this is the feeling that we get. Yeah. No, I, I think that feeling is definitely there. I mean, the the so middle managers it's not in my budget. I don't care. It's just somebody else's problem. We have to break that culture down. And I've seen that where, you know, you get lots of support from the top of the organization, but somehow that support gets eaten alive as it gets passed down. You know, have to stop that. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, I'm speaking from a managerial or an operations management point of view. Um, you were speaking to the idea that we're going to have more stability being brought into the Alberta Health Services. Yeah. And um, the feeling I'm, I'm getting from the staff on the floor very much is that um, they're, there's a lot of initiatives coming down. They're working short-staffed and they're having difficulties coping with yeah. the amount of work that's coming upon them, both the extra work and also the work of caring for their patients. Um, is there any um, plans in yeah. place for, for that? So uh, the, the question is about how many priorities can people actually deal with and uh, you know we, I, I have sessions with frontline managers on roughly a quarterly basis and they basically can't keep up with the number of new things coming into the organization is because they're not you know we have changes from across the organization and everything focuses on that frontline manager or director kind of level and it's not managed. So one of the things that uh, you know, I'm forcing is that we have fewer priorities and be much more clear about our ability to complete them. You know, it, it, you know healthcare is, you know, one reflection of that is how many pilot projects we have that never actually get implemented into real life. And you know, that's a complete waste of time. So you know, we have to, you know, we have to do fewer things, but we have to be really effective about them. And I think you know, if you were to look at the things behind that Institute of Medicine report, those 10, you know, priority areas they have, we will line up a lot of what we're doing with initiatives that line up behind those 10 priorities because it makes sense.
but the re that means that some things, and the, you know, people in healthcare hate to give up their pet projects, but people have to give up their pet projects too. So, well, you know, so that's a, a major change in the way we do business, but it, we have to be much clearer about our priorities. Well, I think uh, we're out of time, oh, but okay. uh, thank you so much for, uh, for uh, Dr. Eagle, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thanks. Thank you.